Okay. Um, my name is Jeff Hildebrand, and I'll be presenting The Sound of Pixels, which actually was the best paper last year in the European Conference on Computer Vision. So first I'll start by uh, showing their interactive demo. Uh, so the goal of this paper was to separate sound sources that were in videos and then map those sound sources uh, where the locations were in the video. So uh, this left video is just the, the ground truth. So this is just what it sounds like when both are playing at the same time. And here when I click the saxophone, you'll notice that only the saxophone sound will play. And here uh, only the guitar will play. Uh, kind of, it's kind of muffled, but. And then if I click a pixel that has no sound, nothing will play. So this, this is the end result of, of the paper and, and uh, I'll explain how they, they got to this point. So as I just explained, um, this is their, they introduced the pixel player, which only takes the frames from the video and the raw audio. The, oh, sorry. Uh, let's see. So it, uh, this, this is a high level view of their entire network, which accepts the input from the uh, image here and the input from the audio is it here and the output is this where every single pixel is mapped to a sound so this this is actually an example of 11 pixels the ones with the blue lines going across are represented as the silent pixels uh, this one here with the green is represented as the violin and this one with red is represented as the guitar as you can see they they map every single pixel in the um, video and mapped the sound that it produces. So D, this one represents, uh, it, it kind of shows that the intensity of the sound where the violin is, is brighter because the intensity was, was louder and here the guitar is a little darker because it was not as loud. And E represents um, a practical use for their application which in this case would be lowering or raising the, the sound of a single sound source. So some of the technologies that they focused on, um, the first one would be sound source separation, where sound source separation is the classic uh, cocktail party problem where you have a whole bunch of people talking at the same time, but you want to just hear one voice at any given time. So you separate that one voice from all the other voices. Uh, visual audio correspondence is using the same cocktail party problem, they take that one separated uh, voice and then they map that to uh, the person that's talking in the actual image. And they also use self-supervised learning. So the only thing that they used as their input was the image from the videos and the audio from the videos. Nothing was labeled. They didn't have the instruments or anything labeled. So I'm going to go over the, the full model overview. They, they had several different networks. The first one I'll go over is the video analysis network. So this one takes in input from the video frames. Uh, they feed it into a modified version of ResNet, which they refer to as the dilated ResNet. The output of this gets fed into a temporal max pooling layer, and then it outputs K image channels. Uh, here is the audio analysis network, and this network takes in the raw audio feed, um, transforms it into a sound spectrogram representation, which is what this looks like, and then that is fed into a modified version of UNET, and the output of UNET is uh, K audio channels of uh, modified spectrogram, or of the modified original spectrogram. Uh, and you'll notice that the there's K audio channels and K image channels. So there's the same number of channels that are output from the video analysis network and the audio analysis network. And uh, that'll come into play more later. And then finally, they have the audio synthesizer network. This network takes the outputs from both the video analysis network and the uh, audio analysis network 
and out outputs a mask. So what the mask is, is if you look at this, you'll notice there's black and white pixels. And these just uh, are multiplied on top of the original sound spectrogram. So all the ones that are one will just be the original sound in this, and all the ones that are black will just be ignored. And this one outputs as many masks as there are uh, different sound sources in the video. So in the example where this one's playing a duet, it, it has two sound sources that it outputs because there's uh, two instruments that are playing. Uh, for training, they had to take a little bit different of approach because they did not have any ground truths. They kind of had to synthetically create them. So in this example, they took two videos and they took the sound from each one of those videos and added them together and fed that added together sound into their audio analysis network. And then they took the image frames from each video and fed that separately into the video analysis network. Then from there, um, the both networks output K channels, both for video and audio. And in the end, it feeds into their audio synthesizer network, which outputs their estimated sound. So if you'll notice the loss, um, they take the estimated sound that came from their audio synthesizer network and compare it against the original sound source from of the video before it got added together. So they synthetically create a complex audio source, separate it, and then refer back to the original before they synthetically combine them. So uh, I'll go over a few of the equations that they used in order to get to this point. Uh, first, I'll go over S-mix. S-mix is simply them adding the audio sources together here. So uh, in, this, in this case, n equals 2 because they have uh, two audio sources or two input sources, two videos. And then the s in hat represents uh, the outputs that come from the audio synthesizer network, where the inputs, the uh, mixed audio, as well as the uh, image frames from each one of the videos. And of course, there'll be a uh, different SN for every sound source. There'll be a different output mask. Um, then they also, as I explained before, the, the um, binary masks that are output from the audio synthesizer network, they experimented with two different types of masks. The one that they ended up using was the binary mask. So the binary mask, uh, all it did was simply, it found all of the output channels. Um, it, it compared all of the output channels, and the one that had the highest activation uh, would get a one, and then the other ones, if they did not meet the threshold, would, would get a zero for each individual pixel. So uh, UV in indicates a, a pixel um, location, and then MN represents the mask that is output. So there'll be N number of masks dependent on how many sound sources there are in the video. And then the, the other mask that they experimented with, with were ratio masks. So instead of the mask being a, a combination of zeros and ones, it was really a, a value between zero and one. And they would, they would apply it the exact same way that they applied the binary mask, where the mask would be output here, and then they would multiply that against the original uh, S-mix audio. And then they, they would then convert that to analog sound. So they experimented with both of those. Uh, for this paper, they also created their own data set. So they, they refer to it as a music data set, which they created it just by searching Google for certain keywords and then parsing out the videos that uh, matched what they wanted. So uh, this represents the number of solos, and then this chunk represents a number of duets. And notice how some of the duets are very unrepresented, which uh, makes it so that creating their synthetic audio that combines all the different types was more important because their data set wasn't as robust as, as needed. And uh, this just represents the uh, duration of, of the videos. And you could see that majority of them around 100 seconds, and they could be anywhere from 20 seconds to 260 seconds. 
So here shows some example frames from their music data set. Notice how they're uh, almost entirely just uh, people playing instruments. And it'll be one to two people. Um, and here is the audio spectrogram representation of the audio over a, a certain amount of time. So it just, here's the frequency over the time there. And that, that's for each one of those videos. So before their network uh, processed the audio, they had to do some manipulation prior. So uh, they first did 11 kilohertz subsampled audio signals, and they made the highest signal frequency at 5.5 kilohertz. They found that this uh, adequately reduced the size of the audio, but at the same time, it did not reduce it enough that they didn't have the important frequencies that they needed. Uh, they segmented the audio into six second segments. Uh, the transformation had a window size of 1022 and a hop length of 256. The time frequency representation of the spectrogram was 512 by 256. And then the output of the model was the mask which they applied over the original um, spectrogram, and then they did an inverse STFT conversion to get the, uh, a signal that could be played as, as audio. So uh, I'll, now I'll go over the different models that they used. So first was the video analysis network. They modified ResNet 18. I'll go over how, how they modified it. First, they removed the last average pooling layer. They removed the last fully connected layer. They removed the stride for the last residual block. And they made the last residual block have a dilation of two. And they also added a three by three convolutional layer with K output channels. And this, this was the important part where um, the output from this convolutional layer was the output of their video analysis network, which also mapped to the same number of audio channels in their audio analysis network. And the input was just a RGB image um, T frames with uh, 224 by 224 by three. And yeah, outputs, uh, image feature, K image features after spatiotemporal max pooling. Uh, the other, one of the other models was the audio analysis network where they modified UNET. Uh, so they have seven convolutions, seven D convolutions. They added skip connections between the convolutions and D convolutions. Uh, they, the input was an audio spectrogram with size 256 by 256 by one. And this output uh, K fe feature maps of size 256 by 256 by K. And notice here that the uh, input and the output have the same size other than just the number of features that they um, did. And, and this, this is a feature of UNET. So I'll go over a little more what, what UNET actually is. So here are the, uh, the convolutions. The convolutions in UNET work very much like a normal convolutional network where uh, it goes down every stage and every stage, you know, it gets better features, but the features get smaller. And then at the bottom, uh, it, it does uh, deconvolution. So it actually uses those features. Here you can see it, it at every single level, it maps back to the same level of convolutions in the deconvolution. And eventually it goes back up and if there's the same number of convolutions as deconvolutions, this one will create uh, a modified version of the original uh, image, or in this case, audio. Uh, UNET was originally used for uh, medical images, so they would have a uh, medical image and they would remo remove all the noise and they would make like the cancerous cells or something more apparent, and then when the doctor looked at it, it would make a lot more sense to them. So that, that was the origins of, of UNET. Um, Lastly, they have their audio synthesizer network. So the audio synthesizer network uh, accepts the outputs from the video and audio analysis network, fuses them together, it outputs uh, a mask, the mass or the same number of masks as there are uh, audio sources. And what was unique about this was it, they made it very simple. So that they only, the only parameters were K number of weights and one bias, and you could see here in this equation, how they applied that, where here's the uh, weights, 
applied against the uh, image features, applied against the sound features, and then they add the bias here. So um, it's, it's not too complicated. And they found that their best model takes three frames as visual input, and they, they set k equals 16 for feature channels. So there's 16 feature channels for both the, the video and audio analysis network. Uh, so for their implementation, they used 500 videos for their training. They used both solos and duets for their training. And for validation, they used only solos. And the reason they used only solos was because uh, the only ground truth they had was from separating out two combined uh, solo videos. So uh, because of the uh, because of the data set that they used did not have uh, all of the ground truths labeled that this was the only way they could do the validation. Um, then they used the 84 videos for testing, which were only duets, because that is the real world scenario for their uh, uh, sound separation. They also used uh, silent videos. So what they did was they just uh, took background images from the ADE, ADE data set, and then they combined that with just a flat line audio, so there's no audio. And this helped uh, them train to know where the silent sections in the videos were. Um, and then for their implementation, they only ever used two videos at a time. But in theory, they could use a lot more. But they found uh, two videos, combining the uh, sound from two videos at any given time gave the best results. And they used an SGD optimizer with a very small learning rate since it was pre-trained on ImageNet. So uh, here is an example of two videos and how they combine them. So the, the mixed spectrogram here is the spectrogram representation of the two uh, audio from both of those videos combined. Uh, this is what the ground truth mask looks like. This is what their predicted mask looked like. And this is the ground truth spectrogram. So one thing to notice is the ground truth mask uh, correlates exactly to the ground truth spectrogram. So you'll see that the ground truth masked all of the things that are white are mapped to actual sounds from, from this video. So the ground truth spectrogram is just the actual sound that existed in these videos. And here's the predicted spectrogram, which is this predicted mass applied on top of the mixed spectrogram. And, and this is what that looks like. And uh, here's just some additional examples um, using the same process. So for the results, um, they had to uh, use a, a bunch of parameters to do their calculations. So um, I'll, I'll go over the parameters right now. S target represents um, the original sound source of the videos. Um, the interference, uh, that's uh, very similar to noise, actually, in that it's just kind of uh, random interference throughout the um, sound source, where it's just like, OK, there'll be random uh, noise throughout the, the source. Um, the artifacts are different than noise, where it's artifacts are more actual structures that are incorrect, that the um, end estimated um, sound source produced. So some of the things that they'll measure the performance by is source to uh, distortion ratio, which is the target divided by the interference, noise, and artifact. The source to interferences, which is just the target divided by the interferences. And the source to artifacts, which is the target added together with the interference, the noise divided by the artifacts. So uh, here will be uh, the results that they got. These two networks were their baselines. They actually use uh, ground truths to, to train, which their data set did not actually have any ground truths. So how they produced their ground truths was MIT did additional research on producing uh, video segmentations uh, through weekly labeled data. And they were using the uh, convolutional neural network channels to do that. So, so the, the ground truths here is, is produced by uh, other work that they've done. Here is the uh, results for the spectral regression network, which the spectral regression network is just uh, the network without, or the, the audio output of their 
audio network where it did not use the masks for the synthesizer network. So uh, this is just, if they didn't have the final step, they, this is the output from the spectral regression. Uh, the ratio mask, which I went over earlier, um, here are the results with both the linear scale and the log scale for their frequencies. They found that the log scale worked better than linear. And the ones that had the best results were, was the binary mask with the linear and log scale and with the log scale doing the best. However, they um, found that the results from this weren't really indicative of how well it separated uh, the sound. So they did additional uh, results by crowdsourcing. And I'll, I'll go over that later. So uh, this is an example of uh, a visualization of which pixels are making sounds. And here you could see that the darker the color, the more intense the sound is coming from, from that location. And here is the separation of what sounds do these pixels make, where each color represents a different sound source. So you can see it, it did fairly well in separating them. Um, so the visual audio corresponding activations. So I, earlier I was talking about the K image channels and the K audio channels. So this is an example of uh, channel six, which learned on to recognize violin. So uh, both the audio and video channels recognized violin. This is what the visual activations look like on that particular channel. Notice that it, it in the duet that it only focused on where the violin was and same with the solo. And here's what the audio activations look like for that particular channel. Here are two other examples of, of channels where this channel specialized on guitar and this channel ended up being specialized on xylophone. So they didn't really find out what these channels did during training. It wasn't until they actually used their labeled data during testing that they found out that these channels map to these particular instruments. So here's actually a, a confusion map of uh, all the different channels and what the channels represented. So for whatever reason, accordion did, did very well for recognizing visual. Um, because uh, uh, accordion has I guess a unique look and it also has a unique sound and the sound is what helped uh, the uh, image channels to, to get specialized. And you'll notice that cello was uh, kind of all over the place, uh, most likely because cello sounds more similar to other instruments, I'm not entirely sure. But And then um, here is the uh, channel activations for the audio network where xylophone and accordion both did very well. And cello was kind of uh, performed poorly, same as with the visual, because both of these correlate with each other, where the, the visual kind of learns from the audio. And here is the, uh, the threshold for the intersection over union, just for the, the as I, I mentioned earlier, the ground truths that they used that were generated from their other work, and the accuracy mapped against what their, the channels of their visual uh, network. So with the different thresholds, it, it did a fairly well. So also I mentioned earlier, they uh, have subjective evaluations, which was crowdsourced. Um, they, they basically asked people, which sound do you hear? And the binary mask mapped correctly, where they, they would state the correct sound. Even with the ground truth solo, it, it didn't do 100% since it's largely based on people's ability to know what different instruments sound like. So I guess only 70% of the time, even with ground truths, it was, it was accurate. So the binary mask here, as you could see, did much better than uh, the other networks. Then they also did a similar uh, test with the visual sound correspondence. And they would simply ask, is the sound coming from this pixel? And uh, if there was sound that was supposed to come from the pixel, they would mark yes. And here you could see that the binary mask did uh, much better. OK, thank you. Okay.